The book of Revelation identifies two false prophets historically in the Old Testament that serve as types or symbols of the false prophet in Revelation. At its core, this battle of Armageddon is a battle between truth and error, between good and evil, between righteousness and false righteousness. So the cry of the false prophet. This is part three of our study that we've been doing spread out over a few weeks here on Revelation chapter 13. And we've been looking at the, the beast that comes up out of the earth. And it was actually last month that, or actually two months ago that we started this. Um, the first part, American exceptionalism and the three angels' messages. We looked at this beast that comes up out of the earth and we saw that God has a purpose for this nation. And uh, as many nations in the past, the United States finds its way into Bible prophecy. And God has a purpose for this nation as he has had really for every nation and every people. That is to glorify him. And uh, in Revelation 13, we see that this, this beast from the earth that comes up, it initially uh, professes to serve God. It has two horns like a lamb. And in the book of Revelation, a lamb always points to Jesus, except in this one verse here. So clearly, this power that arises in the flow of prophetic history uh, appears to be Christian. It professes to serve Christ. And then a, a change takes place. This is in Revelation 13, verse 11. Even though it has these horns like a lamb, it ends up speaking as a dragon. So in part two, we looked at American nationalism and the voice of the dragon, and we saw that there is, is now and there will be, according to the Bible, a growing push to combine politics and religion together in this country. Now, this is not the first time in history that this has ever happened anywhere in the world. We can look at many examples in the past. And without exception, every time that church and state unite, whether you're looking at ancient Babylon or Europe in the Middle Ages or more recent examples. Every time that church and state unite, you end up with persecution against some group of people. And uh, so we see a transformation predicted of America. This is part three, the cry of the false prophet. And we're going to be looking at some of the spiritual deceptions that lead to national apostasy. Would it be important to understand what's happening and what will be happening. We don't want to be swept away in this, right? So we're going to be looking at what are these spiritual deceptions. And then in part four, in two weeks, we will look at another Old Testament story that connects with all of this, and that is Elijah on Mount Carmel. If you recall his story, there was a great showdown, wasn't there? Uh, between uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And the question that had to be answered was, who is the true God? And God answered that in a pretty remarkable way, didn't he? Fire comes down from heaven and consumes the altar that Elijah has set up, the sacrifice, the stones, even the water that he had poured on top. And in Revelation chapter 13, fire falls from heaven as well, but it's part of what the false prophet is doing. So it's a counterfeit revival. We'll take a look at that. I'd like to start, however, with this story from the 1990s, late 1990s, maybe some of you will remember this. In 1997, there was a comet that flew close enough to Earth to see. You can see the picture on the left there. It was the comet Hale-Bopp. Anybody remember that? That comet there. And the fellow that you see on the right, his name was Marshall Applewhite. And he was a religious leader of sorts, and over the years leading up to this, he had gathered a following of people, and um, they became known after this story broke as the Heaven's Gate cult. Now, I don't think they referred to themselves as the cult, right? But they referred to themselves as the Heaven's Gate group. And they developed this strange prophetic scenario that there would be a spaceship of aliens associated with this comet, maybe flying in its shadow. I don't know the details of what they believed, but there would be a spaceship coming closely on the heels of this comet. And they believed that this spaceship was there to take their spirits to another planet where they could presumably live forever. And so what they did 
was try to free their spirits so that the spaceship of aliens could take them. And this group of, of people uh, rented a mansion uh, in the days leading up to Hale Bopp's appearance, and they committed mass suicide. And, uh, of course, when the story broke, it occupied the headlines for weeks. And um, everyone was trying to figure out not only why did this fellow believe that, but more importantly, how could he convince so many people to, uh, to believe as he did and then to take that step of, of killing themselves in preparation for something that would never happen. A tragic example of what Jesus warned about in Matthew 24. When Jesus' disciples asked Jesus, what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the world, do you remember the very first thing that Jesus said? He didn't talk about earthquakes first or wars or any other kind of sign. He said, do not be deceived. And he kept coming back to this during his discourse in Matthew chapter 24. At least three times, Jesus comes back to this warning, do not be deceived. And he gets more specific. He says there will be false Christs saying, you know, I am the Messiah. I have come back. Come to the closet or the desert or wherever it may be. And then Jesus also warned about false prophets. And so Jesus saw this coming, didn't he? And this, of course, is not the only example of this kind of thing. Turn with me in your Bible to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. Now, Revelation 16 is the Bible's description of the seven last plagues. These plagues fall after the mark of the beast has been uh, enforced on the world and after people have made their final decisions. How do we know that? Because Revelation 16 begins by telling us that. Let's read the first two verses together. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And verse two goes on, and the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worship his image. So these seven last plagues, here's the good news. You don't ever have to suffer the seven last plagues. Even if you are still living here on planet Earth, God has made a way of escape, right? And that way of escape is putting your trust, your faith in Jesus Christ, keeping through his power the commandments of God, and then avoiding the mark of the beast. Now, the plagues continue. We're not going to work our way through each of those, but we're going to look briefly at the sixth plague because the sixth plague has some very interesting things in it. So, Revelation 16, now in verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of whom? The false prophet. Now, there we go. Now, this false prophet appears several times in the prophecies of Revelation. We don't find this name earlier in Revelation. It's all in the final chapters of Revelation. But there are, there are three powers, aren't there? There's the dragon, there's the beast, and there's the false prophet. And they end up working together to deceive the world, and verse 14 tells us what they do. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now, a couple verses later, it gives a name to that battle, and it, it tells us it's called Armageddon, right? A lot of people know the name Armageddon. Even if you don't go to church, you don't really read your Bible, most people... Uh, have at least heard the idea or the concept of Armageddon, this great final battle that takes place between good and evil. There is one verse in verse 15 that we need to look at just briefly, and I don't have it on the screen, so let's read it in the Bible. Revelation 16, verse 15. Jesus says, Behold, I come as a what? As a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, the book of Revelation is a book of symbols. So the beast is a symbol, the dragon is a symbol, the false prophet, which we'll look at today, that's a symbol. So is the clothing and the 
the warning about being naked, it's all symbolic, right? And so if we look elsewhere in Revelation, such as chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, we see that uh, this idea of being clothed with righteousness, that's applied to the bride of Christ, which we know is it's his people, right? It's, it's his church. And the clothing that God promises to give his people is his righteousness, right? The righteousness of Christ. That's a promise found throughout the Bible. Isaiah has beautiful promises and prophecies about Christ clothing us with his righteousness and also a warning that my righteousness and your righteousness is like filthy rags, right? Now, when Jesus gets married, he's not going to have a bride covered in filthy rags. He's going to have a bride covered in pure, bright white, his righteousness. So whatever this final battle is, this battle of Armageddon, it may include physical fighting. In fact, it probably will. But at its core, it's not just a physical battle between nations or armies here on earth. At its core, this battle of Armageddon is a battle between truth and error, between good and evil, between righteousness and false righteousness. Now, if we look back at verse 13 just briefly, it's kind of interesting. The Bible describes the message that goes out when these three powers unite, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. When they get together, they send a message out to the world, and what kind of animals are symbolically used to describe that message? I think I heard somebody say it. It's frogs, right? Now, in Revelation 14, there's another message from God that goes out around the world. And what kinds of creatures give that message? Angels. Now, you know angels fly in heaven, right? And Revelation 14 describes or depicts these angelic messages as coming, you know, over the face of the earth. So this idea of flying through the air. Where do frogs live? You ever seen a frog flapping through the air like this? They live near water, and what kind of water do they they typically enjoy most? You don't find them by a clear, bubbling brook or stream, do you? You find them by swampy or brackish water. Before we moved down here, we had uh, a house with a sewage lagoon in the back of it. We called it the potty pond. And guess what kind of animals in the summer love that potty pond water? It's frogs, isn't it? I mean, they get real excited if they can hang out near that kind of water. And they croak and they ribbit because they're excited about that kind of environment. I think it illustrates well the kind of message that goes out here in Revelation 16, verse 13. The false prophet does have a message that it is sharing with the world, but it is not a message of truth. It's not a message that comes from heaven or flies to the air, so to speak. This is a message that is fit for the sewer. And if people accept it, if they believe it, if they are deceived by this false prophet's message, they will end up losing out in eternal life. Now, God doesn't want that, of course. So this is why he gives us the warning here. Now, who is the false prophet? That would be a pretty important question to have the Bible answer for us. We're just going to list a few bullet points here, and these are also on your study guide. The false prophet and the beast from the earth are actually the same entity. They represent the same thing. Now, how do we know that? Look at these similarities between the false prophet and the beast that comes out of the earth. Both of them work with the beast to implement the mark of the beast. And you have your Bible references right there. So the false prophet works with the beast power to bring about the mark of the beast. The Bible tells us the exact same thing, that the the beast from the earth works with that first beast that comes out of the sea. That's all in Revelation 13. They work together, and they bring about the mark of the beast. Here's another point of similarity between the false prophet and the beast from the earth. They both use miracles to deceive the world. Right? We just read that verse Revelation 16, verse 14, they are the spirits of devils working what? Miracles. Miracles. And in Revelation chapter 13, if you might keep two fingers in these two chapters, we'll just kind of bounce back and forth. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 13, we have the description of the activities of the beast from the earth. And sure enough, verse 13 says that he doeth great wonders, 
so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And verse 14 kind of repeats that idea. There are miracles and strong deceptions that appeal to people's senses. And here is one of the big keys that we can't miss in Revelation's warnings. If you are trusting what your eyes see or what your ears hear, or what you experience in any other way, at some point, what we bring in through our senses will not be reality. It'll be a deception. How many of you have heard of the metaverse? Kind of a new term that's floating out there. Uh, Facebook renamed their parent company Meta because they want to expand into this area, the metaverse. It's a whole virtual reality. And uh, they're not the only company trying to do this. There is a push to bring humanity into a virtual reality. Now, that's just technology, right? Because people want to make money. But the Bible tells us that there's going to be a virtual reality spiritually. We're looking at the verses right here that, that, that describe this. And if I make decisions spiritually as to what is true or what is not true based on what my senses bring in, I will be deceived at some point. So what's the solution? We have to trust in the Bible, right? We have to trust in something absolute, something that's not subjective, and that something absolute is the Word of God. Okay, here's another point of similarity. Both the false prophet and the beast from the earth lead people to worship the image of the beast. So you notice, they're doing the exact same things, right? Another point of similarity. They are both directed by the spirit of Satan, right? They both work with the dragon, and Revelation is very clear that the dragon is just another name for Satan himself, the devil himself. And finally, both of them fight against God and his people, unfortunately, right? We were mentioning just a few minutes ago that every time in history that church and state have united together, there has always been persecution against those that try to serve God according to the Bible. And the same will be true in the future as well. Okay, so the false prophet is the same power as this beast that comes up out of the earth. So when we read in Revelation this false prophet, what we are really looking at is developments that are going to take place here primarily or first in this nation. As the churches of this country and as this nation which has, you know, for over 200 years upheld civil and religious freedom, as those things change and transform, as church and state come together, and as the churches of this country begin to change in character and saying we need political power, we want political power. We need to bring this nation back to God, which, by the way, needs to happen. <laughs> We're sliding very quickly toward a very dark abyss. But the answer is not to have the church in control of the state. But the false prophet is just another name for this movement that will take place and the message that goes out. Okay. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> The book of Revelation identifies two false prophets historically in the Old Testament that serve as types or symbols of the false prophet in Revelation. So we need to understand who these historical false prophets were, and we're going to look at their stories. We're going to look at one of them today, and the next one, Elijah's story, we'll look at in two weeks. In Revelation 2, we have letters to the seven churches, which represent not only historical churches there in the early church period, but they also represent eras or periods of church history over the last 2,000 years. And the third of these churches is the message to Pergamos. And historically, this was the period when Christianity kind of stepped out of the era of persecution. This would be around Constantine's time when Christianity was legalized. So the physical persecution stopped, but then apostasy uh, and compromise began over the years. That's this period. And let's just read here what God says. So Revelation 2, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. 
I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast thy name and hast not denied my faith, even in the days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Verse 14, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So here is one false prophet that Revelation identifies, and we're going to spend most of our time this morning looking at Balaam's story. He met Israel on the borders of Canaan right at the end of their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, but before they crossed over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. What does that mean typologically? He represents the false prophet that will confront the world and God's people just before Jesus comes back and we go to the heavenly Canaan. Now the Bible says there in verse 14 that he did two things. He caused the children of Israel, Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So that's idolatry. He led them into idolatry and he led them to commit fornication. Now just briefly, this is the sneak peek uh, for our next part in this series. The next church, the message to Thyatira mentions another false prophet. So look in Revelation chapter 2 uh, in verse 20. Again, this is the letter to Thyatira. Verse 20 says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Have you ever heard of her? <laughs> Good or bad woman? <laughs> How many parents name their daughter Jezebel today? I mean, Stacy and I went through a lot of names for our girls, but I can guarantee you, Jezebel was never on the list. You can be thankful for that, girls. This woman is infamous for a reason. Because she fought, not only fought against, she killed many of the true prophets in Israel. She fought against God. And she called herself a prophetess. So she's a false prophet. Look what she did, the second half of verse 20. She taught and, uh, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Idolatry and fornication. Same thing as Balaam. So, one more thing to lay the groundwork here, and then we'll dive into Balaam's story. There is a pattern that emerges in Scripture that applies to the things that we're looking at here today. God has given many time prophecies in the Bible, and without fail, at the end of a prophetic time period, God raises up a prophet to announce the end of that time period and also to lead God's people to tell them what they need to do where they need to go. Just a few examples. The flood didn't come unannounced, did it? God had warned Noah that there'd be 120 years. And so Noah is that prophetic figure that God uses to give the warning, the time period is up, it's time to what? Get in the ark. Tells people the way of salvation. Another example would be the 400 years that Israel was in bondage. And um, God raised up a prophet, his name was Moses. And he used Moses to guide Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery. Another example would be the 70 years in Babylon. God had said through the prophet Jeremiah at the beginning of that period, 70 years, right? One person's lifetime. You will be uh, bondage or a captive in Babylon. But at the end of that time period, God raised up several people, actually. Cyrus, the king of Persia, issued the decree. That had been prophesied by Isaiah 150 years before. So Cyrus was a prophetic figure, issuing the decree, you can go back to Jerusalem. And then the prophets that were there in Jerusalem helping the people were Haggai and Zechariah as they rebuilt the sanctuary in the city. Another example, the 70 week prophecy or the 490 years found in Daniel chapter nine. There are actually several points of fulfillment during the last seven years of that prophecy. Uh, one of those is the appearance of, of uh, John the Baptist as he baptizes Jesus. So the baptism of the Messiah, one, one point of fulfillment. You have the death of Jesus in the middle of those last seven years. And then at the very conclusion of the prophecy, you have another prophetic figure. That was the deacon Stephen. He became the first martyr. He gave a powerful sermon and his reward was being stoned to death. 
So another example, prophetic figures arising at the end of time prophecies. And that leaves us with a final time prophecy, a 1,260 days or years in which the little horn rules during the Middle Ages. Now, we've studied this power many times in the past. It's the same as the beast, the first beast from the sea in Revelation chapter 13. It's that union of church and state during the Middle Ages in Europe. And at the end of that time period, in 1798, another power emerges. That's Revelation 13. That's what we've been looking at the last or the first two parts of this series. That is the United States and its principles of civil and religious freedom. But God doesn't raise up a prophet at the end of that 1,260 years. Instead, there is a false prophet. Remember, the false prophet is the same as the beast that comes out of the earth. Now, that doesn't mean God hasn't used this nation and the people in it. But it does mean that by the end of the story, this nation will make choices that reveal that it is acting as a false prophet. And the churches in this nation particularly will make choices that land them in that category. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 22. We're going to look at six parts of this froggy message <laughs> that gets croaked out to the world that the false prophet has. And all six of these can be found in Balaam's story as he interacts with the children of Israel. By the way, this is interesting. Had God told the Israelites how long they would be wandering in the wilderness? He did, actually. He told them, for every day that the spies were in the land, you will be wandering in the wilderness for one year. Now, they were in the land for 40 days, those spies. So God said, every day for a year, 40 years, you're going to wander in the wilderness. That is a time prophecy, isn't it? And at the end of the prophetic time period, Israel is on the shores of Canaan and they meet a prophetic figure. But he's a false prophet. His name is Balaam. And if the people had chosen to follow God by listening to the true prophet, Moses, they would have been spared a lot of trouble. 24,000 of them died by the end of this story. And we're actually told in the book Patriarchs and Prophets that those that died in that plague were the remainder of the generation that God had said would die in the wilderness. They came that close to reaching salvation. And then they died in the wilderness. That's a warning for us, isn't it? Okay, Numbers 22. Here we go. We'll look at just a few parts of Balaam's story. This is a sad story. It's sad for Balaam. It's sad for Israel. It ends up sad, being sad for the nation that hired Balaam <laughs> to try and curse the Israelites. Let's read verses 1 through 6. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. They're trying to figure out how do we not get destroyed by these Israelites, these Hebrews. So verse 5 goes on. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land, for I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. All right. The Midianites realized they could, uh, and the Moabites realized they could never conquer Israel militarily. Whatever supernatural power was giving them victory, battle after battle, they wanted no part of that fight. And so they correctly realized that the only way that they could win against the Hebrews was supernaturally. So they hire Balaam to uh, curse the people. 
Now, who was Balaam? Interesting what we're told here. Again, the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 439. Balaam was once what? A good man and a prophet of God. But he had apostatized and had given himself up to covetousness. Yet he still professed to be a servant of the Most High. Lesson number one is very simple, friends. A genuine experience with God in the past does not guarantee that we cannot or will not apostatize ourselves in the future. A few examples from the Bible make this very clear. Well, we have Balaam right there. But think of King Saul, right? Now, you know his story. By the end of Saul's story, he is visiting the witch to try to get information. He is completely disconnected and cut off from God, And the day after he visits the witch of Endor, he and his sons die in battle. What a sad ending. His story didn't have to end that way because if you look at the beginning of King Saul's story, he was very humble. He was unsure of himself. In fact, turn with me very briefly. Keep a hand here in numbers. Let's go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Saul had a genuine relationship with God at the beginning of his experience. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Here's the story of when the prophet Samuel anoints Saul to be the king of Israel. Verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Now, God would have never anointed or chosen someone to be king who was at that point disconnected from him. So God saw something good in Saul. Verse 2, When thou art departed from me today, then shalt thou find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin. And they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found, and lo, thy father hath left the care, and sorroweth for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? And we won't go through the whole story, but God is promising Saul that he will help him find his lost donkeys. And God does it. Jump down to verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. And sure enough, it happens. Saul's walking along, and he meets a group of prophets. And uh, just a few verses later, it tells us that the Spirit of God comes upon Saul, and he begins prophesying as well. So the point is simply this. At the beginning of Saul's experience, he has a genuine relationship with God. By the end, he has turned the other way. And we could find other examples. King Uzziah, hundreds of years later, is another example. The Bible says that he, he, he served God and God blesses him at the beginning of his reign. But when he became strong, his heart was lifted up. And Uzziah ends up as king, as a political power, going into the temple. So he's combining the powers of church and state together. And he presumes to direct the worship and the sacrifices that happen there in the temple. And when he's confronted by the priest saying, you shouldn't do this, don't combine the powers of church and state, Isaiah reaches out his hand to probably arrest those priests and kill them. And all of a sudden, leprosy breaks out on his forehead. That's a type of the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is placed on the hand of the forehead. And Isaiah is a leper to the end of his life and presumably never regains that connection with God. So what does this mean for us? There are many of our Christian friends and many churches that will tell you that once you have had a salvational experience, once you've claimed Jesus as your Savior, you cannot be lost, right? Often called once saved, always saved. And it's kind of comforting to think that perhaps, but the Bible simply does not support that. We need a new relationship with Jesus every single day. The Apostle Paul said, I die what? Yearly? Monthly? Weekly? Once a week at church is enough. He said, I die daily. And so this relationship must be renewed. It must be pursued every single day. That's lesson number one. And if we fall into this mindset that what I, my experience with God back then, whether it's a month ago or 10 years ago or whatever, if I fall into that mindset, what I had then is good enough for me now, I'm on dangerous ground. 
Let's continue in Balaam's story. Numbers 22, now verse 7. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. And Balaam said, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. Now, I won't read all these verses for time here. But <clears throat> Balaam wants the reward that Balak is offering, isn't he? Balak didn't come just with a request or an invitation. He had a whole troop of people with lots of money that they were going to offer Balaam. And uh, Balaam wants this reward. He knows that he should not do it. In fact, here's another insightful statement from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. Balaam was not ignorant of God's work in behalf of Israel. And when the messengers announced their errand, he well knew that it was his duty to refuse the rewards of Balak and to dismiss the ambassadors. The bribe of costly gifts and prospective exaltation excited his covetousness. He greedily accepted the offered treasures, and then while professing strict obedience to the will of God, he tried to comply with the desires of Balak. It's a pretty tough path, isn't it, trying to serve God and yourself at the same time? I don't know if any of you have ever found yourself trying to do that. I'll be honest, I've been in that situation from time to time. And it's a no-win situation, isn't it? As long as we are trying to straddle that fence and serve ourselves and serve God, it's a dead-end road. Lesson two, covetousness of any kind leads to apostasy and to ruin. We need to take that warning from Balaam's story. He ultimately loses his life and probably eternal life because he allowed himself to be ruled by covetousness. In fact, Peter, in 2 Peter 2, verse 15, draws a warning from Balaam's story. He says, Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. All right, lesson two. We don't want to fall to covetousness. And I guess to just apply this to our situation today, there are uh, many corners of Christianity that uh, we would often call that the prosperity gospel, wouldn't we? Saying if you serve God, God will bless you. And the, the idea becomes, if you're not blessed financially, then it must be evidence that you're not serving God, right? It's not very different from how the people in Jesus' day saw it. If you're living a good, happy, blessed life, then you're a good person and God is blessing you. But if you happen to be sick or something bad happens, then you must have some secret sin somewhere. And God doesn't operate that way. Um, we were just in our lesson study this morning, seeing how God sends his blessings on everyone, the just and the unjust. Now, there is a reward for righteousness. There is a reward for a good life, but oftentimes that reward, in fact, usually, we have to wait until the next life to see it. That's called living by faith. Let's keep going. Numbers chapter 22 in verse 15. Numbers 22, now verse 15. And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they, because Balaam first turned them away and says, I can't go. And I think he kind of did it with a pouty face. <laughs> Harumph, I can't go with you. I wish I could, but God won't let me. So Balak comes again with more money, more gifts. Verse 16, And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye here also this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me. Did he really expect a different answer this time than the answer God had given him before? He should have known better, right? But he had his own idea of what he wanted to do in life. Verse 20, And God came to Balaam at night and said unto him, 
If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. I don't know if you've ever had an experience in your life where you've pestered God long enough for something and he finally gives it to you. And then after he gives it to you, you realize, whoops, I think maybe I shouldn't have asked for that. It's happened in my life. And uh, I hope I've learned that lesson. Lesson three, following our own will also brings ruin. I mean, these are basic things, right? All right we're not looking at ro- the rocket science of theology here. These are just basic principles. Following our own will brings ruin. Now, here's the warning we should take. Again, the same book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 440. There are thousands at the present day who are pursuing a similar course. They would have no difficulty in understanding their duty if it were in harmony with their inclinations. You know, if everything God asked us to do, whether it was the Bible or in other ways that he speaks to us, if everything he ever said to us was perfectly in line with what we wanted, well, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? But how in the world could God help us grow? and become better people, and become more like him. He knows a lot better than that, doesn't he? And so he stretches us, he pulls us, sometimes he gently pushes us to take those steps of faith that run contrary to what we feel like we want to do. But because these evidences are contrary to their desires and inclinations, they frequently set them aside and presume to go to God to learn their duty. That's what Balaam did. Let me go and pray to God. He already knew what he should or shouldn't do. When one clearly sees a duty, let him not presume to go to God with the prayer that he may be excused from performing it. He should rather with a humble, submissive spirit ask for divine strength and wisdom to meet its claims. Good advice, isn't it? Good advice. Okay, let's go to lesson four. We'll continue with Balaam's story. He eventually does come back now with Balak's men and they find themselves... Uh, now on these mountains. They go to several mountains as Balaam tries once and then twice and then three times to curse Israel. And every time he tries to curse, what happens? A blessing comes out. And um, if you actually read the blessings that Balaam pronounces, these are some of the most beautiful blessings found in the entire Bible. Let's just look at a couple of them. Um, We're going to skip these verses for time, but let's look at some of the blessings. Numbers chapter 23, verse 7. Numbers 23, verse 7. And he took up his parable and said, Balak the king of Moab hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come, defy Israel. Now, is anything false in that statement, or is that all true? It's all true, isn't it? Verse 8. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? That's all true as well. For from the tops of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. I mean, this almost sounds like Isaiah, right? Beautiful, poetic. Uh, prophecies being uttered here. Another example, uh, Numbers 25, uh, 24, verse 5. Numbers chapter 24, verse 5. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel, as the valleys are spread forth, as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of line, of line aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. And his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Again, beautiful prophecies. Last example. Same chapter, Numbers 24, verse 17. And and this is probably the most well-known thing that Balaam says. Verse 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. 
And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob, now here's the verse, verse 19. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. That's a messianic prophecy, friends. A prophecy of the Messiah. It's a beautiful one. Here's the point. Some truth can be spoken by those that do not serve God. Right? So we have to be very careful who we listen to. That includes the person speaking to you today. You've got to compare everything with the Bible for yourself. And many people listen to popular preachers today, and there are many things that are said that are true. But that does not guarantee that it is safe to believe everything that those people say. And that is a mistake that we're all liable to making. This person said that, and I know that's true, so this also must be true. We need to take this warning. Some truth can be spoken by those that do not serve God. Isaiah 8.20 says, To the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Lesson number five. Back in Numbers chapter 22. Verses one, two, and three. I want to look at how Balaam conducted these uh, blessing ceremonies on tops of the mountains. So verse 1, And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho. I think I meant some different verses. Sorry, chapter 23, verse 1. Numbers 23. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here how many altars? Why wouldn't one altar do? Build seven altars and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. And Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by thy burnt offering and I will go. Peradventure the Lord will come to meet me and whatsoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And he went to a high place. Here's the point. Balaam went out of his way to make an impressive worship ceremony, didn't he? Here's what we're told. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 444. Balaam had some knowledge of the sacrificial offerings of the Hebrews, and he hoped that by surpassing them in costly gifts, he might secure the blessing of God and ensure the accomplishment of his sinful projects. Thus, the sentiments of the idolatrous Moabites were gaining control of his mind. His wisdom had become foolishness. His spiritual vision was beclouded. He had brought blindness upon himself by yielding to the power of Satan. Here's the lesson. Genuine worship does not rely on external display. And I don't have to tell you, you know this. You can find any kind of worship service, any style of worship that you want today. If you want a loud one, you can find a loud one. If you want a big one with, you know, All the smoke and mirrors, you can find that. If you want something else, you can find that. And that's kind of what Balaam was doing there on the tops of the mountains. He was making the most impressive worship service that he could in the hopes of, what, appeasing God, waking God up? It's not how it works, is it? So genuine worship does not rely on external display. What does it depend on? Humble spirit, obedience, Love, right? These are the things that will draw us nearer to God. Next lesson, Numbers 25. I'm sorry, my numbers are a bit out of order here. This is actually from Numbers chapter um, 25. So Balaam blesses Israel a number of times, and then he goes home. And Balak, the king, is furious, right? He spent all this money and time, and he hasn't got his curses. Balak, or Balaam comes back to Balak a short time later, and he says, I think I figured this out for you. I think I know how we can get Israel to fall. And so he devises a plot, and um, the plot is described here in chapter 25. Numbers 25, verse 1. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab, 
And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Women from the Moabite uh, tribe began to sneak into the Israelite camp and invite the men of Israel to come and worship with them. And the men of Israel said, okay. And they followed the Moabite women and they began to be, get caught up in false worship and everything that came with it, including food sacrifice to idols and fornication. The very things that the book of Revelation says that Balaam did. And a plague breaks out, and Numbers 25 tells us that 24,000 of the people died in the plague. Well, eventually the plague is stopped. Those that let out in the rebellion are put to death. And then God tells Moses, go to war against the Midianites, and so they do. And the Midianites are subdued, and Balaam is eventually killed in that same battle. The Bible tells us that Balaam was killed along with the Midianites. Here is the lesson, last lesson, lesson number six. What was it that finally broke the defenses of Israel? It was disobedience, wasn't it? Lesson six, obedience to God's commandments is the true test of loyalty. Balaam, the false prophet, finally figured out how to seduce God's people into sin. To say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Or God is too loving. Have you ever heard that idea? God is too loving to actually condemn people or to keep people out of heaven. Everyone will be saved. It doesn't matter. That's one idea. It's expressed many different ways. You've also heard it expressed this way. There's no way you can overcome sin in this life, even with God's help. We have to wait until heaven. Wow. It's really the same idea. Obedience is impossible or not necessary, so why even worry about it? Live your life as you want. God will save you in the end. That is a lie of the false prophet. And anybody or any church or any preacher who will stand up and say that God's commandments don't matter or they were done away with at the cross or whatever it may be, those are lies. God's commandments were written on stone for a reason. He wants to write them on our hearts where they can become part of us, not as a checklist that we have to do, but as a, out of a response of love to our Savior who has emptied heaven's storehouse so that we can be saved. Deuteronomy 13, verse 1, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. In other words, let us break the first or the second commandment. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Friends, we are not saved by keeping the commandments. I hope we all understand that clearly. But my willingness to keep God's commandments is an indication of whether I have truly had a salvational experience with God or not. Right? It's an evidence of where we are at. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and you shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. You know, in Revelation, the false prophet eventually dies. He is put to death along with the beast. And eventually the dragon, Satan himself, suffers the same fate. Because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Well, it's quite a story, isn't it? And it's included in the Bible for a reason, not just to tell us the history, although that's interesting and important. But the Bible itself says that these things were written for us today, upon whom the ends of the world have come. So let's make sure that our relationship with God is genuine 
that uh, our spiritual perception is clear enough that we can recognize the words of Jesus and not get swept away in the false message that comes from the false prophet. And Jesus promises that he can give us that discernment, he can give us that wisdom, most importantly, he can give us that faith in him so that whether our eyes or our ears or our senses are telling us something different, we can know what the Bible says. And most importantly, we can have that relationship with Jesus where we would rather die than knowingly or willfully disobey and dishonor God. Is that your desire today? To have that kind of relationship? Amen.